Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, and from the corporate community Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. While the Obama administration failed to close the Guantanamo Bay prison facility in one fell swoop, the enemy combatant prison population has shrunk considerably under his tenure. Today I welcome Alexa Koenig to reflect on counterterrorism during the Obama years and to consider the national security vision of his successor, the 45th president. She is the executive director of the Human Rights Center and a lecturer in residence at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. Co-author of Hiding in Plain Sight, The Pursuit of War Criminals from Nuremberg to the War on Terror, Koenig has studied closely U.S. detention and interrogation practices, the International Criminal Court, and atrocity prosecutions. Though the legal regimes needed to apprehend suspected war criminals to justice are largely in place, the political will to make arrests happen remains elusive, she and her colleagues write. They conclude, until this situation is rectified, murderers will get away with murder and torturers will retire with pensions. Alexa, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. When you think about the legacy of the Geneva Conventions, mm -hmm. which have been invoked during this election cycle, the Nuremberg trials, do you think of them as informing the current American mindset towards the practice of interrogation, towards the practice of the legal system? I certainly think that Nuremberg plays a huge role in the American psyche. We played such an instrumental role in bringing together the system of justice in the aftermath of World War II. And in the aftermath of that conflict, we really became a leader on the global stage around how we would deal with moments of atrocity, how we would account for them, and account for them in a way that really adheres to a rule of law. So I don't think we've ever lost that as part of our national identity. It's something that is so central to who we are and to this critical role that we played on the global stage. But at the same time, I do think that 9-11 became a shifting point where we began to think about what are both the benefits and the limitations of adhering so closely to the Geneva Conventions. Are there limitations and how are we going to think about our role going forward? It was a moment of tremendous vulnerability for our country and we really had to grapple with our relationship with other countries and other actors in ways that we really hadn't, at least for a very long time. And what was the result of that grappling? One of the things that really emerged in the aftermath of 9-11 was a resurgence of the idea of American exceptionalism. And of course, American exceptionalism is this idea that the United States is a place that's so exceptional that maybe it shouldn't have to adhere to the same bodies of international law that the rest of the world is expected to follow. Um, it's a body of law that we really have played an instrumental role in developing. You hear a lot in the aftermath of 9-11 about the Constitution, of course, being such a strong instrument that the protections that it provides, both for citizens and non-citizens, are so great that in many cases they're even more extreme and more protective than what you would find under the international legal regime. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of attorneys, human rights activists around the world who've challenged that conception, not questioning the strength of the Constitution because it is a strong one and, and perhaps the most strong in the world, but the ways that it was being interpreted in the aftermath of 9-11 to provide a flexibility for good and for potentially bad, depending on the perspective. Right. And let's be specific. Mm -hmm. You really mean black CIA, black sites, enhanced interrogation. Mm -hmm that ought not to be confused with torture. Right. 
And we've seen a clarity of purpose in these Obama years, have we not, in rectifying that aspect of confusion. Yes, I do think that there has been a clear statement towards upholding principles of international law. We see um, narratives of international law coming back into our domestic legal conversation in ways that we hadn't previously. What I do think we've had to grapple with more recently is this trade-off in policy choices. So for example, when we see this ramping up of indefinite detention, particularly at places like Guantanamo in Iraq, Afghanistan, after 9-11, um, there, of course, was an outcry once the abuses were brought to light that had occurred at Abu Ghraib, um, all the amazing investigative journalism that took place during that time. And so you see this shift in the narrative here in the United States around what the American people deem to be acceptable. And of course, there's differences between people's perspectives on that. But the policy alternative to indefinite detention has often been targeted killings. The idea being that when you have potential enemies overseas, that you, need, you feel you need to stop preemptively because you're concerned that they're going to actually attack the United States or otherwise harm its interests in really extreme ways. How do you stop them? One way, of course, is to lock them up. The other is to kill them. And so I think it, that Obama came out so strong in the beginning of his presidency around this need to close Guantanamo and to eliminate black sites. But of course, that means that that allowed, along with the technological development, this upramping of the use of drones for targeted purposes. But both under the Constitution mm -hmm. and under the Geneva Conventions, wouldn't you say that's allowable? You know, I think there are different perspectives on that. I, I do think the dominant understanding right now is that when you are conducting a war, that you can certainly have isolated killings when you, um, as long as those killings are proportional, the killing of civilians are proportional to the military objectives. Now, there is some back and forth as to whether our checks and balances and the legal framework we have in place is protective enough to ensure that the balance we're striking is really an appropriate one. Um, one of the areas that's been particularly criticized is this idea of signature strikes. So not necessarily targeting an individual for his or her particular identity and knowledge of what he or she is about to do, but because they have a certain signature, whether it's clothing that they wear or places that they hang out, that suggests they may be affiliated with terrorism. And that's where I think a lot of human rights attorneys, civil rights attorneys are beginning to push back and say, we need something a little bit more stringent than that for moving forward. We heard during this election cycle, one of the presidential candidates talk about carpet bombing. Mm -hmm. That is where you might draw the line between what is constitutionally permissible and what is an unavoidable conflict, not just mm -hmm. with our own law, but international dictates as well. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Americans see scanned images from airplanes of Boko Haram, ISIS, and when you talk about a targeted drone strike, mm -hmm. in many instances, we shouldn't be focused on individuals, we should be focused on exterminating the entire entity. And this mm -hmm. is where it becomes tricky because the families who are presumably innocent bystanders to this um, are in question and potentially their lives are in jeopardy. So where do you draw the line? It, that's a great question. I mean, I think there are certainly advantages to drone strikes in the sense that, of course, American personnel are not there in the planes. Um, you c do have a degree of precision that perhaps you don't under, say, carpet bombing. Um, and that's important. This idea of proportionality is such an important one when you're talking about war crime situations where whatever you do has to be, the civilian deaths have to be proportional to um, your military objectives, and you can't have them be excessive. I think what we need is more information, quite frankly, at this point. I know Obama's administration is about to make a statement soon um, around civilian deaths from drone strikes. We also, though, I think need to weigh some of the costs. So I think we've been a little bit, um, I don't want to say glib, but we've been a little bit optimistic about the benefits over the costs. There have been, there's been a number of studies recently that have shown that the impact on the men and women who are controlling drones, even from remote locations, is more extreme than we thought it would be. Certainly, the numbers that are being gathered around civilian deaths by investigative journalists are higher than what the administration has suggested they really are. 
So the more transparency we can have around this, both around the scope of damage, the precision of these attacks, the countries in which we're using them, and, and I think there's a debate there as well. So strikes that we're doing, for example, in Yemen or Somalia, countries with which we're not at war, whether there, a war on terror is broad enough to legitimize strikes that are done in those countries, or whether because we're not at war with those countries, these are actually illegal acts that invade some degree of sovereignty is a question on the table. And that question around this table is one that we consider in defining war. And when, mm -hmm. when I think opponents of the Bush administration were critical of this idea of a war on terrorism, well, it isn't a war against a state. Right. If it is, it's a state of ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but there's mm -hmm. so much merged together that, to my mind, it always justified the idea of calling, differentiating mm -hmm. it from a war against Iraq or Afghanistan, right? right? T tell our viewers about this idea, Hiding in Plain Sight, mm -hmm. and this is the title also of a forthcoming documentary on PBS. What do you mean by Hiding in Plain Sight? Great question. Um, it means many different things. The book was really oriented around how, when you have the worst human rights abuses in the world, the most egregious war crimes, do you get the highest level perpetrators, the commanders, the presidents of countries behind bars if you can show that they actually played a seminal role in whatever atrocity took place. Um, what we've seen over the last 60, 70 years is that so many of these highest level people basically go free. And we can even see that in the context of Abu Ghraib, where yes, we had prosecutions at sort of the middle level and below for the abuses that happened there, but they, they only went up so high. Um, how do you get people like al-Bashir of Sudan, who's been in indicted now twice by the International Criminal Court? Or, um, of course, we just had a conviction a couple of weeks ago around Karadich, who was hiding out in Belgrade, who actually assumed a different identity as well, grew a big bushy beard, and pretended to be a New Age healer. He was a sexologist for a while. And there's a great story in the book where he used to go to a bar, you know, on a fairly regular basis, and there was a big portrait of him as the president of the Serb Republic hanging in that bar. And he would sit in that very room, and there were a number of people in that room who had no idea who he was. Of course, there were enough people who did know who he was that when the political incentives shifted and Serbia really wanted to become a part of the European Union, um, that there were people that did go and apprehend him. Of course, you have al-Bashir, the president of Sudan, who's on the cover of the book, who's not hiding out, who's not using some kind of pseudonym, but is basically flaunting his you know, purported immunity or what he's saying should be his immunity as a head of state. Well, this whole idea of justice in the 21st century is that there should be no immunity for a head of state if he or she is the individual who's actually committed these atrocities or led for these atrocities to be committed against vulnerable citizens. So he's openly traveling the world. He's had over 70-something delegation visits, and nobody has arrested him, even those countries that are legally obligated to do so because they're parties to the International Criminal Court. To what do you attribute that? Political will. I think that increasingly, as we did our research, we interviewed pretty much every major war crimes tribunal leader, from the chief prosecutors to the tracking teams to diplomats who are engaged in creating these tribunals, and asked them, how do you get these people in custody? When you've had success, why has it been? And when you haven't, why not? And we really looked at three things. We looked at the legal constraints and opportunities, the operational constraints and opportunities, and the political constraints and opportunities. And what we ultimately found is that it's always politics. It's going to dictate who goes to, who faces justice. Why do you think that um, in an increasingly globalized mm -hmm. environment, there has been a concession peer countries are actually conceding any right they may have to mm -hmm. intervene on behalf of the people who are denied justice mm -hmm. because of a corrupt regime. Right. I think there's a few things going on. I think states are beginning to be nervous that actually presidents could go to jail for the crimes that, that people commit in their name. Um, and so there's a precedent setting issue that's of concern. Another issue that we found, actually there's a couple. One is that it really takes individuals in a lot of these cases to continue the dogged pursuit of individuals to get them behind bars. Often the political trade-offs are such that it's easier for people to allow the status quo to remain. People are concerned about the potential purported trade-offs between peace 
and um, accountability, which I think in many cases is actually a false trade-off. I think a lot of times they can actually go hand in hand and peace may be furthered when you have some form of accountability mm -hmm. from the people. Um, I think there's also a tension in the narrative. So for example, in Africa right now, you see a lot of pushback against the International Criminal Court and the idea of the court being neo-colonialist. Um, I think there are certainly concerns around the fact that so many cases have happened right now in Africa, although you see the preliminary investigations expanding mm -hmm. beyond that region. But you talk to the survivors in a lot of the countries in which we work, and many of them want the International Criminal Court there. It's the higher ups who are often saying that this is something that those countries don't want. So there's a tension in those narratives in many of these contexts. I think it's also a temporal issue. So one thing that you realize when you look at the arc of justice from say the 1940s to the present day is that sometimes it takes 20 to 30 years to actually get the highest level people to be accountable for their crimes. And the reason for that are multiple. One really important one is A, their political power wanes and they're less important on the, on the global stage at a certain point. Their political allies and protectors fall from power and so there's a vulnerability. Um, second, you have a rediscovery of the crimes of your fathers, you know, a generation down the line. You really see that in the World War II context, when um, a couple, last name of Klarsfeld, really pursued the Nazis 20, 30 years after World War II and were determined to ensure some kind of legal accountability. There's a famous um, incident, and we talk about it a little bit in the book, where Beat Klarsfeld actually slaps the chancellor of Germany, and she basically says, this is the child slapping the father for his sins. Um, and and a, nece a necessity to move on by atoning for what's happened previously. Right. It's not a lack of jurisdiction per se, mm -hmm. because the criminal court has developed a reputation mm -hmm. for a very glacial process, but one that does seek out and punish um, folks who who commit these crimes but in the American context we don't subscribe to their legitimacy in so far as their pursuit of justice against Don Rumsfeld and right. George W. Bush, right? So there is a kind of question of legitimacy of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So the United States obviously played a very central role in developing the Rome Statute, which is the body of law that brought the International Criminal Court into being. So we were engaged early on. And this notion of an international criminal court has been around since the 19th century. And we've been big promulgators of that vision. Um, 9-11 happened and I think there were new concerns about the potential of impacting U.S. sovereignty by bringing, holding U.S. administrators or officials um, accountable in an international court. At the same time, we're really seeing kind of a moving away from this idea of American exceptionalism towards greater engagement with the system of international global justice. One of the most recent examples would be Syria, where my understanding is that there are several individuals in the State Department and elsewhere who are actually helping to develop a body of evidence so that if the International Criminal Court eventually receives a referral around the crimes that are currently being perpetrated in Syria, there's going to be an overwhelming amount of evidence um, collected in part through the United States and in part through NGOs that have really been doing some amazing work on that front. It isn't the concern of the United States as well and the Western world, if you can speak broadly, that empowering these judicial bodies could ultimately upend um, liberal society as we know it? And let's take the case of Gaddafi. Sure. The result has been unleashed terrorism um, and an unleashing of extremist mm -hmm. ideas um, and the further development of ISIS. And so the Americans have, the, mm -hmm. the American perspective has been torn, as you said, a lot of mixed signals being uh, delivered retrospectively about that engagement because yes, were there crimes committed, but is the greater crime what's going on now? Mm, great question. Um, you know, I think the way that we need to think about these international courts is as a tool in a toolkit. So when you talk about Gaddafi and you talk about Libya, of course, in, that, in Gaddafi's case in particular, there was no bringing him to a court of law. You know, courts have a number of different functions in society. Some of them are symbolic. Some of them are very pragmatic. And but do you, do you think if, if, if it had not been an assassination or death, rather through the channel of justice, right. that what would have happened? That would have led to a more sustainable Libya? 
That's a, an excellent question. I'm not so I'm not sure, and I don't think we'll have an opportunity to figure that out. Um, what I do think is that we need different groups who have different roles to play in this idea of global justice, really doing their job. And maybe it's because I'm an American attorney and believe strongly in this idea of zealous advocacy. The court's job is to actually prosecute individuals, you know, around whom there is actual evidence of war crimes abuses in that court of law. For diplomats, for people who are representing different countries, who are thinking a lot about foreign policy and the relationship of countries, theirs is to, to really weigh those trade-offs of whether a court of law is the best mechanism for accountability going forward and for the greatest amount of stability. And there's a lot of tension um, sometimes, at least in the dominant narrative. Richard Goldstone, who was the first chief prosecutor for the Yugoslavia Tribunal and for the Rwanda Tribunal, I think is a great example of someone who was able to really work that, that fine line between the court's objectives and the di diplomatic objectives and really try and tease out what are the security ramifications if you actually do shift some of this accountability into courts. Let me ask you about Rwanda. Uh, of course, the horrors we can see um, still to this day, mm -hmm. you identify the UN as failing to provide the peacekeeping tools to resolve the conflict as it was occurring in real time, mm -hmm. and then later doubling down on that failure in provi not providing the equipment to navigate the legal, the, the legal process, sure. identify who the culprits were, whether it was the government or the extremists. Mm -hmm. And so as that country, it's hard to believe, but that country is still alive and still right. has a government. In the Rwandan case, you see the International Criminal Tribunal playing a really um, normalizing role to some extent, sending a signal that the international community will at least acknowledge what has happened in the country and ensure that some people are brought to justice for it in very tangible ways. I think both Rwanda and the former Yugoslavian tribunal are seen as successes in the sense of having brought as many people to justice um, as was part of its mandate. Of course, the vast majority of people who were actually prosecuted ended up not being prosecuted in the Rwanda tribunal itself, but in local courts. Um, thousands and thousands of people compared to, you know, the relatively small numbers that you see in the Rwanda tribunal. I do think it, it was something where it would have been, obviously the, the United States, the global actors, should have probably played an earlier role in acknowledging and somehow trying to address the issues that were unfolding in Rwanda in very rapid time, admittedly. Um, I think this was some, uh, some attempt to actually create a historic narrative around what did occur with the idea of at least having people come together around that narrative and agree on that narrative so that you can move forward. And has there been a reconciliation within the country between the descendants of the Hutus and the Tutsis? That's a great question. Um, I have not spent much time on the ground in Rwanda. I've spent some time at the tribunal, which of course isn't in Rwanda proper. I have heard of some attempts that I think are a little bit difficult. I mean, it is very hard to get true reconciliation, and I think that's one of the things that we continue to struggle with, both in the Rwandan context and elsewhere. So there have been attempts to have these reconciliation you know, moments where you bring together survivors with the people who killed someone's loved ones and hopefully have some degree of healing and moving on. Sure. Whether you can actually ever reconcile with the man who has raped you or has killed your child or burned your house, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical. How does that compare, though, to the growth of violent extremism mm -hmm. elsewhere in Africa? Because that was a more insular conflict, right. whereas in northern Africa especially, there's, I think, a different phenomenon going on. Yeah, and I think that points to one of the challenges for the International Criminal Court. So you look at the Rwandan Tribunal, you look at, at the Yugoslavian Tribunal, they had limited geographic mandates, limited temporal mandates. The International Criminal Court is supposed to be crossing geographic borders and dealing with some of these messier conflicts that we're seeing today. I don't think we're quite ready for the messiness of that, and I don't think we've had a lot of precedent for it. Um, so the war on terror, trying to fight ISIS or ISIL and to figure out, do we have authority to bomb, you know, or to target individuals across countries and in countries with which we're not at war? That's all being debated and played out right now. Um, from when you say we're not ready for it, what do you mean? 
I think that there are a lot of instances throughout history where you see technology getting ahead of legal frameworks. Drones are one great example of that, where we ended up with the capacity to target individuals in places all over the globe very early on, but we don't yet have a legal framework in place. Right. We've been limited in the use, predominantly in the early 2000s, to the United States using them for targeted assassinations, but that's changing quickly. Um, so there's this game of catch-up that we're always playing. But what about not the technology, but the mm -hmm. genocide itself? The genocide right. the of ISIS spread across against, borders. against Christians and against mm -hmm. many, many, a huge preponderance of Muslims. Mm -hmm. So that te the technology isn't a question there in right. terms of how the courts can resolve these conflicts, but they can't, is the reality they can't parachute in because you know, the IEDs are going off every other day and beheadings are still occurring. I mean, it's, it's a volatile situation in which the legal process cannot inhabit yet? Is that it's a couple of things. I think, one, it's a question of resources. So whether you're talking about military intervention or you're talking about international criminal court and getting some kind of legal accountability, you have to figure out how you're going to best utilize those resources, and that's tricky. So if you look at the International Criminal Court's Office of the Prosecutor, a colleague of mine at the Human Rights Center says repeatedly, their overall budget each year is smaller than that for the police in the city of Berkeley. Mm. Um, that's a really small amount of money, and they can't be everywhere at all times. They have a very small team, and it's very hard for them legally to get on the ground in a lot of these countries and actually gather the evidence that's needed to actually build these cases, some of the most complicated cases we've ever seen. Um, so I think there's a lot of strategizing about can you use local actors to be gathering evidence of war crimes? How do you do that and not further endanger those like local citizens? Are there NGOs on the ground that can be taking video? Now that we have this proliferation of smartphones, can we basically harness those new technologies to expand the strength and the ability to get evidence of these crimes going forward? Finally, Alexa, mm -hmm. is there any debate in your mind that what uh, ISIS is capable of and what they've been doing mm -hmm. qualifies as genocide? You know, I think there are really strong arguments right now that it is, particularly in some of those contexts. I think that the United States has made some strong, different actors in the United States have made some strong comments that suggest it is. Um, because that definition seems to be imperative in triggering any action. Right. Well, and I think there's two definitions, and we need to be really clear about what we're talking about with genocide. There's genocide as sort of a normative term. It's sort of the lay understanding right. that we're having mass killings of tar people who are targeted for a broad range of reasons. From a legal perspective, it's actually a very narrow definition, and what you can actually get a legal accountability for in the genocide context is super small. You only have, um, you could only have those targeted killings be around four very small areas like political, for political reasons, racial, ethnic reasons, etc. And you have to prove the intent of the perpetrator. In a legal context, it's a very difficult, difficult thing to prove. When it comes to ISIS, you know, there's enough out there that I don't think that will be as hard as it has been in other contexts. Alexa, thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and from the Corporate Community, Mutual of America.